upstream parts for fabrication to welding, tight tolerances, get you a better product. We'll get different variances of, of thick material. They'll all get cut on this laser cutter right here. Typically from this laser area, we'll get, again, like a stenciled out steel piece. This is where it essentially gets formed. And this is one of our newest pieces of equipment. This is our profile router. We bought this with the Overland, the frame market in mind. To your knowledge, is there another frame in the world like this? No. Not that I know of. I mean, I've not been in all, as, as though I look like I'm old enough to be all around the world. No. <laughs> But I've never seen one constructed like this. But in this day and age, you can't find a Kentucky Fried Chicken pretty much anywhere in the world. <laughs> yeah. No, but in all seriousness, yeah. Daryl, I think our frame and our suspension, just that alone, puts us above any competition that's out there. I mean, the strength gussets that we talked about, I don't know anybody that's doing anything like that. You know, the interior backer plates that Jeff talked about, you know, when you look at these rivets, uh, uh, immediately you think, well, this is riveted into this aluminum frame. Well, it's not. It's the story behind the story, you know. Uh, and to be honest with you, he taught me something. I, I thought that riveted into the aluminum plate. He's riveted it into a steel backer plate. So again, giving it strength, giving it rigidity, but yet not filling it up with a heavier steel. So using it if and when it's called for, and when and where we need it. So yeah. also there, like this, this rear wing here. Yeah. This is not just welded onto this section. Can you explain how this was secured onto here? These are installed. Yeah, Jeff. Pretty much piecemeal together through here. So how far that, that goes in, how that far? From here. Is there one of those available that you can show us how that looks actually? That's yeah. three different parts. Oh, that's three different parts. So these get pre-assembled together. But if you hold that beside there, you can kind of see how far that yeah. goes in. Yeah. That goes into there, actually. So this is actually the other side, but um, it'll go in on there. But so it's still, this is utilizing some of the leverage in here, in here to hold yeah. the, the strength to it. And then there's another piece in here, this steel piece. This one goes on the other side and gets moved into here as well. And then they're sandwiched together with these big bolts as well. See, Shane, this is where our recovery hooks are secured on too. Yeah. So why does this look like this? So this is just raw aluminum from the laser, okay. which looks different than this. So typically we, had, we, we told them just to grind it, buff it out, uh -huh. so it matches a little closer to this. It's not a perfect match. So it's a different type of material? So this has, this has a brush to it. So this yeah. has a line to the extrusion. This is, this is plate extrusion. So. Yeah. Or this is plate aluminum, not extruded in. Right. So it has that. Both aluminum. That. You've heard the term brushed aluminum. It's a, it's, a, it's a cosmetic effect, and that's what that is. So there's no sense putting that into there. Yeah. Gotcha. By the way, this is Ben. <laughs> he's he's not been with us here all the time. <laughs> not on this frame here, but they're all over here, like the brush guards. I know when we started talking about brush guards, you know, I gave you the challenge. I want these to be strong enough where you can actually stand on them. Yep. Because a lot of our competition always puts a sticker on, so it's not a step. Huh. These here will support you. Yeah. So I'll stand on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we could probably all stand on that, right? Daryl, you care to demonstrate? No, I'm too busy making chicken right now. <laughs> it's so nice, nice to be, so good about me. You guys are gonna have a little something extra in your in your chicken bucket. <laughs> is this steel or uh, uh, aluminum? Steel. steel. This is steel. So, yeah. steel bumper and powder coated. So, I know questions that we've gotten before, Ben, were steel on aluminum. Can you talk about that? Yeah, again, it's it's all powder coated, and that that applies the separation. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's where we're at. Right now. So there, he's he, but he, what he's referencing then, in engineering terms, is what galvanic corrosion. Thank you, galvanic corrosion. That's what you're referencing. Um, but so why, so why do we not have to worry about that? Well, it's got it's got to have a surface that is open, allow that current to flow. Mm -hmm. That's all powder coated, so that surface isn't open. So what about if we go off roading? We're going up and down like crazy. Now we're rubbing that powder coat off. Is that possible? I don't believe we'd be rubbing the powder coat off at the joints. Cool. You'd have to get between the step bar and the aluminum. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Let's put it this way: if you get this close in here. You're too close. 
<laughs> you got another problem. The interior steel plate is all powder coated. Yep. So, and that's never going to get scratched off because it's all protected. Okay. So I'd imagine you don't have to worry. But we've had those questions. Pop now, over. what are these made out of the, the huck rivets? What aluminum. Aluminum. There's, there is a few of them that are steel. Ones we use that are steel are inside, outside of water and contamination. Okay. And we have done galvanic really cast on the joints with the steel rings. Okay. Any, any structural stability whatsoever. Okay. We ran them through a thousand hour uh, saltwater tub. So the joints with the rivets, so we did steel rivets joined onto the aluminum. Okay. Uh, and when we say steel, they're uh, galvanized. Yeah. So we ran those through a thousand hour salt water test and saw them next basically nothing. But we're very comfortable with the rivets and how they're doing it. Yeah. That makes sense. Let's go to the front end and talk about the A frame. Well, the A frame's not on here yet. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah. Right here, this is kind of an overlooked area. Like, like I said, since we had control of the material and we're not buying it off the shelf, and we had this designed to actually to his spec, and so he's allowed for this ridge to set. So now you're not taking a board and just compressing it down so tight that it forms around this bend. You're just getting a nice, flush, flat seam. That's also very helpful for manufacturing because the way that the engineers were designed that did it, Ryan put it together, he could actually drop stuff in. So all these cross methods, when they go to assemble and they drop them in, they rivet them in, and they rivet them in. So they don't have to worry about setting height. Okay. That whole issue goes away entirely. We'll yeah. always be where we want them to be. And everything is already pre-drilled, so where they're pre-drilled, you know, they just they just assemble. One yeah. of our goals was to make it as as not as we can. Yeah. Let's just make it sort of a, a Lego yeah. setup. I'm oversimplifying, but that that was that's the intention. Yeah, that makes sense. Quality perspective. Yeah, because you have that consistency always. The A-frame, Ben. Did you speak to it going through the cross member? Because I know yesterday when I showed this to Shane, you know, he thought the A-frame stopped here. Oh, no. And then when we actually showed him that it all it goes all the way back in here. Yeah, it has to drive all the way to the back. For the outsides, it drives all the way back to the outside rail. For the inside, it all drives all the way back to that cross member, and then it integrates into that cross member and all the other cross members um, as it comes forward. They don't always have to be that way. In fact, there's another one we're working on that's actually under. Um, we did this because of the drop frame to keep the height as low as we can. Yeah. But the integrated A-frame provides a lot of additional strength as well. So, and it provides as much uh, ground um, clearance as we can get with the design of trying to get the, the drop frame on this unit. Yeah. But this A-frame has to come back through all of these members to have the strength that it needs. And we've got three, not two. So we got the center member as well. Good stuff. This aluminum is extremely thick. Is that yeah. like common for, for spill? <laughs> Uh, these, um, the drop frame extrusions are common extrusions that we were able to get through off, off the market. Uh, the main rail extrusions, all those are made custom for us. We ran FEA on everything. Everything is designed to certain loads and certain deflections. Yeah. So um, if it was available, we sized it, particularly on the main frames and that, the setup of that whole structure, that was all done for numerous reasons, for the outside flange to screw it into for the for the um, walls, to the drop-in cross members, to the uh, to the undermount of the um, of the um, underbelly, yeah. all of that was designed to be as simple as possible to assemble, and not an afterthought, which it usually becomes because well, I got to attach it somehow. Yeah. And he spoke about the A-frame. He said, you know, a lot of overland units have a have a bigger A-frame so they can get a, a different burning radius. I mean, we kind of designed this A-frame just off of a traditional RV sizing, right? Yep. So, I mean, that's something potentially that we want to look to in the future. Yeah, so so basically we, we will run it through the same FEA. Yeah. We basically lengthen it, we determine what the thickness has to be, how many members, and yeah. and, and then um, and then just make sure it's going to take the load with, with the appropriate amount of deflection. One of the things is we, we don't want a lot of deflection or you start to run into other, other issues. So our goal is to keep deflection as low as possible. I think that would have been kind of cool when we were over there eating lunch and just go out into that room, I don't know. They have like this machine shut up where they can put like, was it the A-frame or something you had set up? Yep. Where it just goes through repeated abuse. Uh, yeah. How many times, you know, so they yeah. can test it. We've got, our, our testing capabilities are fantastic. We got, we got a really good team as well as good equipment to where we can actually 
if we can get inputs from the track and if we get inputs from the field, we can actually go in and replicate them. And then we can actually do bench tests and replicate field testing. So we do that when, when appropriate. And, and we try to, we've been working at creating profiles so we can do more efficient cycle testing. But didn't you like on the A-frame, didn't you do like uh, pressure testing too? You, like you put jacks on it and you put a certain amount of pressure and you kept going to see how much it actually it could take. You yeah, well actually that, that came off of track data. So we grabbed track data and then we actually looked at how many G's we actually would get at certain locations. And then basically we took that data, rolled it into a test and then we did a, a static test to try to see uh, what kind of deflection we'd get to make sure and that actually resulted in a change to this A-frame this A-frame initially was smaller, and, um, and we determined that that was inappropriate because we were getting way too much deflection. Yeah. So, so that was the test that Maynard's talking about was our evaluation of this frame versus that frame. Um, in addition to the wall, we wanted to see what the bonded wall, how much structure does that actually create for us? It creates a lot of structure, but it still wasn't enough relative to the A-frame. Yeah. So all, all that goes into the development of the frames, how do we test them, how do we evaluate them, and just making sure that it's set for the proper duty cycle for this kind of a product. Yeah. Well, well I mean, one thing that I learned soon when I started researching the Overland market is the Overland, they don't just build it good enough, they build it better than, than you need. Yeah. And that's what this frame is, you know, we didn't just build it so it's good enough, we build it above and beyond. Yeah. That's your model. Uh, above and beyond. <laughs> yeah, above and beyond. <laughs> and if you ever would need to have a serial number, there's probably we kind of hide it underneath. But every frame has a tag on this with a serial number of the frame and such. So yeah, they seem pretty incredible. They look very, very robust. And this is the first frame, per se, that you actually did mass production like this. Uh, yeah. On a toy on a cobalt, something yep. cobalt like this, yeah. I mean, I think you ran like a couple of protos for some other stuff, so yeah. to, to this extent, oh, yeah, this is the first time with them. Let's see, that's what's cool saying is like this, this area here is dedicated to our product. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. And they dedicated a section of their building just to put in our... Pretty, pretty cool. You guys must like uh, Maynard. <laughs> <laughs> when you think about it though, so I had this dream, I approached Daryl, Wow. And he believed enough in me in my dream to make this type of investment. Yeah, that's pretty humbling if you stop thinking. That's, uh, I mean, yeah. they spent the money that they spent on a vision and a dream has not even been proven that they were willing to invest and do something like that for us. Yeah, you know, you don't just see that every day. Yeah, anyway, it makes me uh, makes me want to put some I mean, pressure on to help. I mean, it was, it, that goes to the testament that. Daryl believed in me and they believed enough in Daryl to, to take Daryl's word for it to, to do that. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it is very cool. Shane's looking at me like I don't believe any of that. <laughs> <laughs> this is the independent suspension, kind of where we started. You saw the real, you know, bare bones of the un independent suspension in that area. You saw kind of the raw steel parts. You saw the hangers being welded. It eventually comes into looking something like this. This will go underneath the coach. It'll get, in this case, this particular one will get bolted underneath the coach and independent suspension axles. Like I said, this is kind of the concept that birthed the overlanding suspension. Same concept, independent wheel travel. This one just utilizes, you can see, it's hard to see actually. You can see there's a rubber shear spring on the back side of this plate right here. If you look, if you look just underneath right there, you'll see the shock absorb up the front side. Yeah, I see, I see it right there. And this one you can see uses a, it uses a typical Monroe shock absorber. So again, this was, this is essentially for fifth wheels. This is the Cadillac of suspension systems. Yours goes a step further with airbags. Yours goes a step further with Bilstein shocks. You notice one shock on this, you've got two Bilstein shocks on your air suspension. So we can keep meandering that direction. So now we are in the, this is, independent suspension assembly area and we're getting into your air suspension area as well and it's so pretty in blue <laughs> is that your guys's color or is that what's that is that your guys's color pause huh yeah blue is blue, blue is more, more right color okay. we actually okay we actually get requested to do blue a blue sticker or blue parts just because it's kind of the name on the front of the jersey if you will you yeah know? so yeah. it's re it's a recognizable thing you know, you can think of Ford, 
you brand. think of Ford Blue. Typically names. And blue. and so the industry is is very much that way. You know, the different companies will adopt certain colors: yellow, red, um, more eye blue. Yeah. So, I guess as far as the process and the assembly goes, how does this how does this differ from a typical axle suspension or independent suspension? I guess what goes into the build process for this? Com completely different components. Uh, so this is this is our entry into airbags as opposed to the rubber shear springs. Instead of just being a run of the mill everyday shock absorber, you're using what? Bill Stu shock. Thank yeah. you. That's that's what, and so, you know, when you, when you, you watch these uh, television commercials and they, you know, and they're talking about Rainbow brakes with Bilstein shocks, you know, Bilstein is a recognized champion in this category, performs, yeah, to a whole different level. So assembly process though, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, put your stuff together, bolts it all together. A lot of torque, torque specs to hit. Um, we got torque wrenches for them to do on these heavy duty. Alignment is set with fixed. It's sent to the customer and then they can adjust alignment as needed um, by undoing the one lock bolt and then um, using the slots for the rest of them, so. So this does have the capability then based on what you're saying to go to a, a semi truck and tire store and actually do an, as a, an alignment. Yeah right there so it's not in a fixed location the toe and camber is also set up very very well from a standpoint of you basically put your ratchet in the end of the end of it and loosen it up and that's how you adjust your camber your toe or these these push pull bolts are there for the toe but like like you say we basically are setting them we pin them from factory if something like that isn't set correct could that make more or less sway um Maybe it, it can affect sway. It can also affect uh, tire wear, is where we usually see it. So when we're talking about if the if these were to rupture and flatten, is this a bump stop you guys are talking about, or there's an internal bump stop? There's an internal bump stop inside here. An external bump stop. So that's the external bump stop. Yeah. But there's a, there's a cone that is about yay high that sits inside of here. That is an internal bump stop as well. So that's the primary stop. And they thought behind that bin was what? Well, we want to be able to. We, we've still got to send out the information as to the requirements for speed, um, but we want to be able to get home. So yeah. if you end up blowing a bag, um, and we actually monitor, our control system monitors if you blow a bag, so it suddenly sees the heat pressure change and it hits an angle, then it double checks, it tries to fill, if it can't fill, it dumps and both out of the bump stops. Okay. So so that way, as you're going down the road, we need to make sure we're safe. So if we, if we have that 12 inches of travel, you don't want to have one side suddenly drop, you can't do nothing about it. Yeah. And then you end up uh, with it you know, driving down the road like this. So, Did you talk about these? Black cable. Yeah, so that's the full extension strap just to make sure. So the shock's only designed to go so far, so that, that stops overstroke of the of, uh, This is like a limit strap. chain. Yeah, that, that's what it is. Yeah. Can you put too much air into the airbags and blow them? Um, no, we, uh, we max it out at 100 PSI. So they're good for well over that. So that's why I set it at that, just to make sure that you... What if a customer were to use the external trader valves and do it? Um, I'd have to check the specs, but you got to get, I think it's over 150. So you have to get way up there before you... They would, they would. I, mean, I mean, you could probably can get 300 pounds. I'm sure something bad will happen. Yeah, don't do that. You go to a gas station, you're lucky to blow up a kid's bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> those little, those little coin operators. Yeah, that's the one. I can't even fill my truck tire. Yeah, I know. There's, yeah. there's a max fill spec. I can't remember if it's like 140, 150 pounds. Yeah. So we, we're purposely staying well below that. So obviously you can see independent swing arm, you know, um, you're familiar with that term and what's going on here. Do we know like the load test rating or anything like, has that been put under a, I don't know, machine. Done, we did some early cycling, um, but as far as uh, the testing of the suspension, we did that on the durability. Okay. And we identified uh, some changes we made on the durability that basically took it. Um, on the durability, we saw a little bit of loss of camber, okay. which resulted in a whole restructuring of this section. <clears throat> right here. So we saw a little bit of movement here, so we made we basically pulled all this together and um, that 
obviously it was helpful for us. So, so right now, Ben, um, you know, our weights are not, are a little bit heavier, not quite where we would want them at, potentially. Um, the suspension has a lot of weight to it. Do you see where there's a chance that some weight could be taken to the future or no? We would need to do a fairly significant amount of testing yeah. just to make sure we don't have issues with deflection because we've designed it a lot, a lot of the same concept as what we've learned in suspensions with, with the IS because we've been building that one for 20 years. Yeah. So we know that the requirement for that suspension is where it's got to be. Yeah. While it's weighing it, it's right around 680 pounds for, for a set. So we got dual, we're you know, around 12 to 1400 pounds that we're putting into our unit. I mean, the features of it outweigh the weight. They feel, it feels like it's, it feels like it's overbuilt, I think is what, I, I mean, that it looks like it's overbuilt, but that's like. So let me ask you a question. When you went up those mountains and mowed. No, oh, I, I like it. Did you feel like it was overbuilt? No, I, I liked it. I think it's great. Uh, I, I think it's great. It's, it's, do you know how much it, one of these sets weighs? Not off the top of my head. Our yeah. weight, when we weighed it on, we had like a four by four scale that we put it on. It came in around 680 pounds. Oh yeah, that's what you said, 608. So I mean, that was, oh, that was the tires, tires included. Okay, but it was one one set, right? One set. So if you so, do a dual, two, so almost 700 you're 13, pounds. You're 13 to 1400 pounds. So no, that was that was disassembly. Yeah. So this whole thing right here, yeah, seven, with the tires on with it. The tires. 680. We were at 680 pounds. I'm gonna go back and weigh some uh, other suspension. I think it's gonna come in like half that weight. I mean, it's just heavy. We, it got heavier as a result of testing we did on durability. Yeah. So there's areas where we could potentially look at different things, but we would have to run it through a durability and get yeah. it on the link. Yeah. You know, the one thing that we wanted to do was the day that you took it to Moab, um, of course, we didn't know you then, but the thing that we wanted was we wanted no failures. You know, we didn't want to take this product out and apologize for anything. So right from the very beginning, when we went through testing, we didn't take it through the uh, the testing requirements that you would take just a normal RV into because we're not building what I like to refer to as mall crawlers. You know, we're 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 you know we're not that guy that wants to to look the part, but you're only going to take it to the UP mall. You know, we want to be the guys like ROA that takes it out, puts it to the extreme test. And I think uh, Maynard or you or somebody said one time that, you know, why are you guys pushing this? Are you gonna really take a trailer that that size and do the things you do with it? And I think you said, and then he followed up with, but you know what, because you can is why I wanna own it. Yeah, yeah. You know, sure. did we overbuild it? We don't know. One thing we do know though, is we don't have to ask for apologies or well, ask for forgiveness because it failed. And I'll add, I'll add that a thousand mile durability, <clears throat> at the end of it, you're expecting failures because that's typically viewed as end of life. So in the durability world, you take it to a thousand miles, it hits the right course. And, and, and so a thousand it. miles equates to what in lifetime travel, somewhere, roughly? Somewhere, just... somewhere around, they usually say it's um, the equivalent of, of different companies that have done it, I won't mention them, uh, but major companies run thousand mile durabilities and assume about 25 years okay. of hard use. So I think every day, yeah, uh, delivery type vehicles, those types of situations. Yeah. So, so the testing we did on Navistar, we ran it a thousand miles. But we, we also added a military course on top of that test. Okay. So, so that testing is equivalent to, you're saying 25, 25 years, years of hard use. Yep. So, and, well, and, and so yeah. people draw different correlations. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a big thing. You, you actually have your own databases and all those things, but yeah. it equates to a very long time. But at the end of that, we didn't want any failures. Okay. So we designed it. So we had, like, like I said early on, we had some. We were seeing some camber movement. We consider that unacceptable. So came in, read, read, read the structure. So we don't expect to lose camber. We don't want people to have to uh, every 500 miles they drive a unit to have to do an alignment. That's crazy. Yeah. So let's make it so that it's, it's rigid enough to where uh, you're not constantly tweaking on it. Yeah, we have a trailer brand that we used to sell. We won't name it and. The alignment was coming due about every 500 miles. Yeah, you know, it, it, yeah, was, it was crazy. That we we definitely don't want that situation. So yeah. we, obviously we we we're still building building history in the field. So even though it's a heavier suspension, we know it's going to perform. Yeah, you yeah. know, you can go down that trail and not worry that's going to fall off. And, so, and, and you know, one of the things, and I, I've worked a lot of RV shows, and you know, price 
is 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 what it is. But you know, uh, people will come by and say, well, why does this can of pop cost more than that can of pop? You know, they're both in an aluminum can. Well, you know, you don't know what's in the can that makes up the, the, the product, you know, uh, and maybe that's even a, a bad analogy, but you know, part of what we're doing and what we're talking about here, when people talk about price, well, why is the price what it is, whether it's here or whether it's here, this is a part of that story. And this is really what needs to be told because their uh, quick overview of it until you get into that real experienced guy or lady or girl is, well, they both got four wheels and they got a hitch and they go down the road. So much. Yeah. So and, much. And, and the, the engineer that designed this has 25 years of experience in suspensions. So he's, like I say, it's we, we've, we ran all the FEAs, we did all the development, but uh, we, we didn't, we don't want failures. Right. So we want, we want it to, we want it to be structurally sound. Yeah. And that's fine. And that's, we just tell people get a 2500 and you'll be okay. Exactly. Right? Exactly. You're not going to pull it with yeah. a Jeep Gladiator. It, this too was heavy. Not built for a Jeep Gladiator. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. I think some people reach out and they're like, "Why is it so heavy?" Yeah. But it's not designed for a light duty truck. It's, it's really it's not designed for. And there's some, some pretty cool ATCs and power wagons and no, there's no cool Chevy. Wait, is there any tremors? Is what I meant to say. ATCs are not that great. Yeah. 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 Well, <laughs> I got and GMCs. GMC. Nobody. GMC. Even, <laughs> the only reason they call them GMCs is because they have trouble spelling. Let's, let's, <laughs> okay. So, what what truck is in the shop right now? Who's driving the shop? <laughs> Is it your Ram? Oh, and my Ram. Both of our Rams are in the shop right yeah. now. Yeah. No said. Oh, no oh, he dropped the mic. <laughs> I, th I think my, my Ford's an O2. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, you know, Ford, Chevy, and Dodge, and one of the things that they do, too, is, is you know, uh, we all want to sell products. Will they, you know, will a particular truck, my, I, I had a, I had a, a Chevy in this particular case, you know, and it says you can tow 11,000 pounds with it. And can I? I wouldn't want to. Could I? Probably. They said I could. Would I? No. Why, why wouldn't I? You know, pulling is one thing, stopping it is another. Yeah. So, you know, having the right truck to fit the, you know, having the right gear for the course is, yeah. Yeah. Number sure. one. For sure, you know. So yeah. this here is is what makes the pause a pause. Oh yeah, this is this is unbelievably impressive. I I think we have some old broken suspensions in at our facility that I think I want to take back and try to weigh, mm -hmm. get a comparison okay. because I, I mean I just know by touching and seeing it, this is way bigger, heavier. Mm -hmm. I mean it's beefier, mm -hmm. but it's not going to fail, mm -hmm. and I would rather it not fail than anything. Mm -hmm. So. One thing that I, I, I would suggest, and it's something we got to think through and walk through, but because everything about this coach is either uh, preparatory to what we're doing for Maynard, uh, and, and one of those things is just the, the paint for customers that may have a suspension like this, it's in the field and, you know, it's going to hit rocks, it's going to take paint off and in time, you know, they want to touch it up and they don't want to go down to Ace Hardware and get a can of gloss black paint yeah. and then when they paint it on there it just sticks out so we do have aerosols available and i think we're going to want to to make those available like to customers package too. Package yeah. Yeah. So, yeah or if i mean we've had customers even call in here already and said hey on my pin box my mori pin box i and i've hit this and i've tipped it up do you guys have a a, a, a spray uh, paint that will match and the answer to that is Yes, we do. So uh, if you run into that, or if you run into a need for it, let us know and, you know. Is this a different powder coat than we have on our fenders and our front? Uh, this one is, yeah. This is this P Black 7 here, isn't it? Yes, yeah. just the standard brand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so this is, yeah, the one that we're using on your fenders is, I don't even know what that. It's a coal, a rough coal. Yeah. 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 What'd you say? Yeah. 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 Sandpaper. Exactly. Sandpaper. Sand yeah. yeah. It's, it's very core, very heavy. Um, yeah. The viscosity of that. How'd you like that word? Nice. Huh? Viscosity. Yeah. Is, is, is just, yeah. Off that the charts. Pretty, that was pretty huh? smart. You, you like, like for a guy to make Look what, seriously. <laughs> uh, 
It's a good thing I like you guys. <laughs> when this tour is over, you know. you're quite the lexicon of words, you know. Oh, lexicon! I like that. Wasn't that a little green guy? Alexa, <laughs> a lexicon. <laughs> the newness of of paws and and what it brings to to Moride and the Moride family. And when I mean that, I'm not talking about the. I'm talking about the extended family, you know, everybody here at Moride. It's just an exciting space, you know. Yeah. It, we've always been in the, in the supplier vendor arena at some point, whether that's suspension or whether it's TV lifts or what have you. But this, this represents about as close to a finished Moride product, I yeah. guess, is the best way to say it. Yeah. You know, with a group of people like, like Maynard, and Forest River that's just committed to it. Yeah. You know, I think that's part of the reason Maynard and I click, I think, is because you know you can have that can, and that can it was designed to hold that liquid. Well, what else could that can be? If you cut the top out of it, could be a flower pot, you know? Could And so I think it's just that thinking. I don't know, I, th I feel like the overland industry has the potential to change the RV industry, hopefully. Yeah for the better, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. Kind of like yeah. what like Toyota and Honda did to the car industry. Yeah. You know, where it shook it up and made yeah. them, made them change. Yeah. The big car, cars weren't, they were going downhill and Honda and Toyota made yeah. them step up. And I feel like that's kind of what, potentially the Australian kind of infiltrating yes. the, the market yeah. has made pause come yeah. about right right because essentially that's kind of what inspired it yeah but i think that could trickle to every single man which is a good thing for everybody in the end yeah elkhart county elkhart this area is the rv capital of the world but yet when people were talking about rvs uh overlanding coaches that you know stood the test of time and hit the rugged mile everybody said australia 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 and so we're like well that makes no sense i mean if we're the RV capital of the world, why are we going to Australia? Nothing against the Australians, but, yeah, no. you know, they pushed it to a different level. So that's what we want to do. You know, yeah. we want to compete in that arena. We're not, we're not really looking to build the mall crawler. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you're about. But if you really want to hit the rugged road, you know, we want somebody that's going to, you know, something that's going to hold up like you guys are putting through. Yeah. I think the public is starting to, uh, I think they're ready for, a shake up in the industry, you know? Yeah. Like better quality, higher standards in general. Exactly, right? exactly. And they're willing to pay for it. Yeah. They're, you know, if, if, if it's gonna cost this dollar, then, you know, uh, I'm okay with that. I, I wish it wasn't that high, but if it is, then just tell me what I'm buying for that dollar. Yeah. You know? Make it quality, yeah. right? Exactly. You know, it does. And, and quality goes deeper. I mean, in my opinion, you know, quality goes deeper than, you know, aren't the lights pretty behind the knobs? To build a quality product, you have to get at its foundation. You have to get at the roots of it, you yeah. know. Which is the companies behind it, right? Yes. It can't yes. just be. Yes. There yeah. are a lot of companies in this area that, I mean, truly want to be and do build quality products, you know. Yeah. Um, we're just, and Maynard is just trying to set a different expectation, you know, for this product. Yeah. Like I say, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with a mall crawler. You know, it's just not what, what Paws is building. I already liked it before I ever came out here, but now it's like just seeing each piece yeah. come together, going to the, we went to the cabinet shop today, right? Yeah. And here, and like even the cabinets, like the fact that he has a face and a backing. Yes. And then Maynard says, well, when you tap on it, it makes it metally sound. So can you put some foam inside to dampen it? Right. I'm just like, I can just see so many people being like, it's metal. What do you, what do you expect, right? right? So he has this way of seeing. There's always a way to improve it, make it better, which is very unique. But a lot of people are just like satisfied and say, ship it. Yeah, which there, there needs to be a balance because you do need does. to, you do need to ship does. it and make money and, yeah. and stay in business. But right, but but also people that have that 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 ability to see how to improve it. That's those are the people who change. Exactly, exactly, exactly. 
That's what's neat about this area though, really. I've been in this RV industry over 40 years and, and it truly is. When I talk about the RV industry as a whole, it truly is a family and at its core and at its roots. Yeah, there's a lot of different brands, a lot of different flavors and a lot of different what have you, but at, at its core, the RV family is an RV family.